Hello, Serious Survivor here, and the focus of this video is to look at how an attack could theoretically take place in a short time frame, and we're looking at an absolute worst case scenario. This is with the majority of the cyber attacks hitting their intended targets and doing the disruption that they had intended to do. And this is basically a timeline that will cause the most panic and chaos before the event gets even more serious. But first, a word from our sponsors. Gold and silver have stood the test of time. They give stability in times like these. Start an IRA this month with Noble Gold and along with the first class service, they're gifting a one tenth ounce gold bullion American Eagle coin. And you'll have the peace of mind that you've made the right choice as well as growing thousands of extra tax deferred dollars in your fund over the years, safely and steadily. Visit noblegoldinvestments.com. That's noblegoldinvestments.com. Here we'll look at a well-coordinated, state-sponsored, or state-led cyber attack that's an attack on a nation not to just cause a grid-down scenario and not for financial gain, but to cause psychological effects within the first hour. Then, building on that with visible physical efforts that cause society to come to a grinding halt. Stopping our everyday lives and realizing that a small beginning like this can result in a massive impact on everything we have known and taken for granted. And this will result in a collapse of society and a realization of its totality resulting in a grid down leading into what will eventually happen a worst case scenario. These will occur, but to have the most significant effect or to inflict the most damage, meaning electronically, physically, and mentally, these will start with seemingly simple, small things that we don't normally think about. Then it will expand. I expect an attack of this magnitude to begin early on that day and progress through the four stages within 72 hours. Maybe a little less as some things will go down simultaneously or concurrently. And this will begin with systems and devices that will be disrupted to cause the most confusion, fear, and panic initially, and then cascade onward as each service and system that's taken down will grow in magnitude and frequency, causing the initial panic from the first wave to increase almost exponentially. The first will come in what I call pre-waves. These types of attacks will take place up to 48 hours in advance and they'll be disguised as normal ransomware. And this will most likely occur to our food services and our fuel. And by performing ransomware attacks similar to what we saw on the pipeline and on the meat processing plants, that this type of attack does have an impact within for the fuel was within hours. For the food was by the next day we started seeing an impact in some areas of the nation. Now, if multiple ones of these are targeted, then taking them down within 48 hours, we will begin to see some type of food shortage. And by causing a supply chain issue, such as food shortages and fuel shortages in the beginning before the primary cyber attack begins, then people will already be beginning to panic in some areas. It may seem difficult since close to 90% of the infrastructure, ports, shipyards, trains, and trucking services, and others are all different companies with different network structures. A group doesn't need to disrupt or hack all of them, just the core systems, the delivery of goods, the trucks. Once the trucks stop, ships cannot be unloaded, and with our dependence on trucking, the train yards and ports will eventually come to a standstill, probably within 24 hours. With JIT or just-in-time delivery, this means that companies do not have storage for enormous amounts of goods on site. They rely on shipping them out, just the same as stores rely on receiving these shipments every day or every other day. With no storage and delivery possibilities, then production has come to a standstill. In the pre-stages, the attacks will be disguised as normal ransomware, and most people will not take it seriously to begin with. People will fall back into the relative comfort of everything will be fine, that these companies will pay the ransom and the supply chain will be back to functioning shortly. But little do they know this is just the beginning, a primer of what's to come. The reason is if a shortage of food and other goods is created, then when the real attack commences, there will already be a shortage and panic and chaos will ensue almost immediately as the waves of attack begin. The first attacks will be done to inflict damage and loss of services now and in the future. Because by damaging systems, as opposed to taking them ransom, this will prevent us from rerouting or possibly even repairing some of these systems and power supplies to get them back up and operational. 
So these attacks will be intended to do permanent damage and they will cause an immediate impact on every aspect of society. Wave number one, the beginning, government agencies. This will continue simultaneously through all waves of the attack. Every aspect of our government will be under attack from the beginning through the end of the waves in this. So this will be ongoing through all four waves. Some of the intents that hackers would look to gain from hacking into the government agencies is control of our missile defense systems, control of our missile systems, control of government satellites, control of government surveillance programs. And these would be some of the things that once this control is gained would be turned against us. Although I don't feel like it would happen in the first wave, I feel like it would take until at least the fourth wave before hackers were able to get complete control of any of these systems. Pharmacies, hospitals, doctors, ambulances. We all know that in a grid down scenario that these are gonna fall and they're gonna fall pretty quick. But with a cyber attack, then this can inflict a lot of damage without taking down the power grid. So people are still able to communicate. People are still able to access the internet. People are still able to turn the lights on. So this isn't gonna cause that level of confusion. And for a lot of people, they may think this isn't gonna cause any confusion. But when you go to the pharmacy to pick up your pills that day, and the pharmacy tells you their systems are down and you're not going to be able to get your prescription refilled, this can be very serious for a lot of different people. And when the hospital systems go down, they're gonna have it extremely difficult to take in new patients and coordinate their efforts internally. This effect is going to be felt immediately. Now, this isn't gonna seem like a world ending event, but for those people that are working in it or those people that are relying on it, they're gonna see the inconvenience that it's going to cause, a major inconvenience at that moment these systems go down and although this event on its own is not enough to bring society to a standstill it will cause panic and fear in a lot of different people when we combine this with what's next traffic control systems and this includes trains subways air traffic control and even hacking into our vehicles when traffic control systems are brought to a halt if every red light in the city turns red if every red light in the city turns green then we're going to see a lot of accidents if all of the traffic control systems in place fail simultaneously or start giving the wrong indicators then we're going to see massive traffic jams on every major road or highway or interstate and this will be because the traffic control systems themselves have stopped which is causing a backup or because they've all opened or turned green and allow people to pass through when they shouldn't, causing a cascade of wrecks that cause a backup on every major road or interstate. If the air traffic control is hacked, then that's going to cause a major issue with any of these planes attempting to land. And it's hard to even speculate the type of death toll that we would probably see immediately from that type of hack. Hacking into our cars, a lot of systems are computer controlled and and vulnerability for these computer systems is a major issue for a lot of companies. And if someone does hack into your vehicle that's computer controlled, then they can do a lot of damage to that vehicle. But in reality, they don't have to do anything except change the starting sequence to where the vehicle simply will not start back up again. So they don't have to do anything, I guess you would say nefarious, make these vehicles run on their own. All they have to do is stop them, which in turn, if they stop 10% of the traffic on the highways, today then that's going to add to these major traffic jams that we're going to see in all of our roadways smart homes on its own this may not seem like a major impact but most smart homes are going to be connected to a network of some type and if that network is hacked and it affects thousands of homes throughout the country or even hundreds of thousands of homes throughout the country then this is not going to have a life or death effect for a lot of these people but it is going to have another psychological effect when you add this on top of the traffic control systems, on top of the pharmacies and hospitals that have been basically shut down due to their computer systems failing, then we're starting to see a series of events that is cascading and building on itself, causing more and more chaos. Next would be the stock market and financial institutions. This will absolutely increase the panic 100% probably. Because with the panic that's already beginning due to agencies shutting down to the hospitals, due to ambulances not being able to respond, then there's gonna be a wave of panic that's already sweeping through the nation. Then the traffic control systems and smart homes filling, all the smart homes being the least of that, then we're gonna see not just the wave of panic, but a backlog. Everyone stopped everywhere, bringing the entire nation basically into a gridlock 
type of scenario. And once these institutions are hacked and do shut down, they don't even have to collapse to begin with. They just have to stop trading to lock bank accounts or do whatever they're going to do. But by affecting this, this is going to have a dramatic impact across the board, across the entire nation. Banks. Although banks may seem like they fall into the same category as the stock market, the stock market is something that would have an effect on those who are invested in the stock market. The banking system basically affects every single one because the banking systems, if they cannot process transactions, you can't buy anything. If the ATMs are hacked into and go down, they don't have to do anything except shut them off. And once people are isolated from their funds, then they can't purchase anything. And at this point, this becomes a deadly situation for some people. Police and fire. The police and fire department systems will be hacked simultaneously throughout this entire event. Police and fire will not be able to respond. They will not be able to coordinate services. And for some of the events that have already occurred, the traffic accidents alone are going to be enough to keep these services busy even if they can respond and can get to the areas where the accidents were. So this is dramatically going to limit any police and fire department's capabilities. If they can't communicate with one another, then they can't coordinate any efforts whatsoever and they're basically left operating on their own in the location they happen to be in when all this began. So in the first wave, we see a series of events or events taking place simultaneously, concurrently. These events in themselves on their own are not going to be enough to shut down a nation. But what is accomplished with this first wave is now we have a nation that still has communication. So we still have the internet, we still have cell phones, we still have cable TV. So at this point, people are starting to get on the internet. People are starting to try to find out what's going on. And people are beginning to panic because along with the truth that they may be hearing, that there's going to be so much misinformation out there. And a lot of this misinformation will be provided by the hackers themselves by posting on social media. And they're going to push their propaganda as they're taking our system down piece by piece. This is going to increase people's anxiety. This is going to make those who knew that something was going to happen get ready to start bugging out while other people begin to panic and other people begin to worry about what they're going to do for their medication. When is this going to be straightened out? And emotions from there will steamroll. The second wave. The second wave will begin within hours of the first wave. And these attacks will be much more severe. These attacks are what will literally bring the nation to a standstill. The first three of these attacks will happen simultaneously, while the last two in the second wave will come one after the other. The first is gas, natural gas, our water supply, and our sewage control. These are all of these services that we take for granted. Natural gas. With the natural gas, not just the pipelines, but the refineries, these can be hacked into to cause physical damage along with the loss of the ability to use natural gas to cook and heat and do whatever people do with it. If the pressures of the tanks are modified or the gas mixture ratios are changed, then this could cause a situation that could cause an internal explosion, a very huge explosion in these facilities. If some of these are physically damaged in that way, then that's going to bring the supply of natural gas to a stop. Since this is the worst case scenario type of attack, I would expect that at least 50% of the natural gas refineries that they hack into would be exploded as to the other 50 being shut down so they could be used by the enemy later. The water supply. The water supply is a very dangerous situation because in the sewage control and water supply, then if these systems are hacked into, then a multitude of things could happen. And if the population control was the goal here, the water supply could simply be poisoned by adding too many of the chemicals that are already used in it or not enough. The same as sewage control. Not much has to be done there. If you stop processing sewage, then we're going to start seeing backups in a lot of areas of the nation. And this is going to cause a very detrimental effect. Next is satellite communication. Satellites are typically controlled from ground stations, and these stations run computers with software vulnerabilities just like any other computer, and these can be exploited by these hackers. If hackers were to infiltrate these computers, they could send malicious commands to the satellites, and this would give them the ability to control the satellites, or if this is a state-sponsored cyber attack, that state probably has their own satellites and they just want to destroy ours so they could not be retaken in the future. And in the second wave, the government hacks will continue. And at this point, the hackers will most likely have access to surveillance and some of the military communications that are left. 
This gives them a great deal more intelligence than any citizen in the United States would have at that point. Next, if this attack is intended to do the absolute worst damage and to cause the most panic possible, the next step in the second wave is to hack into the emergency broadcast system. Imagine if you turn on your TV and you see the emergency broadcast system tells you that there are nuclear missiles headed towards your city and you have 30 minutes to evacuate. People are going to evacuate, no questions asked, therefore freeing that city up for a very easy military occupation. I'm not saying that's what they would do, but if the hackers have access to the emergency broadcast system, even if it's only half of the systems, because these are generally state or locally run for the most part, if, even if they only have control of half of these systems, then they can direct and send half of the population at that point in time to the areas they want to send them to. They could send them to areas to be attacked. They could send them to areas near a power station and then cause it to melt down. There's a lot of different scenarios that could be included here. And this is pretty much an open topic because if they do have control of the emergency broadcast system, then that makes the next thing in this category that much more important. After broadcasting, whatever emergency messages uh, the enemy feels necessary to direct our population into the areas they feel necessary, the next step would be to take down all forms of communication. This would be the cell relay towers, our communication networks, our cell phones, and our internet. Because for most people, if the last message you saw was that hacked emergency broadcast, that's where most people are gonna go. And at this point, the enemy has accomplished their goal of moving the population to the area that they wanna move them to for whatever plans they have next. The third wave. The third wave will begin the night of that first day, and it will begin with our power plants. More than 120 Americans are within 50 miles of a nuclear reactor. The general area, approximately the 10 mile radius, is the evacuation area. If you're within 10 miles of a nuclear reactor and there is a possibility of meltdown, you need to get that 10 mile radius away. Some international guidelines, some state guidelines recommend that a 50 mile radius may be necessary depending on the plume of the radioactive material and the wind patterns in your particular area. So power plants will be attacked the same as we talked about gas refineries, although I wouldn't expect all of the power plants in the United States to be vulnerable to a meltdown that's done remotely through a hacking attack. Some will. And that's what we have to be aware of. Really is as simple as changing the frequency on some of the drives that control the movement of the reactor rods in the core. It could be a lot of different things. But by melting down basically or sabotaging several nuclear power plants, then you've created uninhabitable zones that also, if this is done strategically, can herd people in the direction the enemy wants them to go in. The next part of the third wave is a total grid down. The United States is broken up into three sections in our power grid, so this would have to be a well-coordinated attack to do this simultaneously. But that's what we're talking about here. With the total grid down, this means a total loss of electric power everywhere. The loss of the capability to generate that. And with the grid down, then this also stops all of the production facilities. Any place that was still producing goods is no longer producing goods. With the nation already being at a standstill, then this is going to isolate those who were not where they wanted to be to wherever they happen to be when this happens. So having a plan in place for this type of event is essential. Most people will not survive the grid down, not because of their survival skills or their intelligence, or their physical abilities, but because they don't have a plan. Also through the third wave, government attacks will now continue. And after the first stages of government attacks, now the enemies are at the point to where they can possibly control some of the missile control systems, some of the missile defense systems, critical military infrastructure resources, and our automated air force or drones. And these could be used, in theory anyway, to be turned back on the citizens of the United States. Next is the fourth wave. The fourth wave is the final stage. This is full military invasion from one or multiple actors. At this point, people will be isolated in places that they hadn't intended to be. The grid will be completely down. There will be no means of communication. The military will be limited due to the attacks on its infrastructure. And with communications down, with satellites down, with the internet down, 
If one part of the country is attacked by a foreign nation, other parts of that country may not even know this until it's too late. If you live in New York, for example, and Florida is invaded, if the grid is down and the internet is down and all means of communication is down, then you're not going to know that Florida was invaded and you're not going to know that the enemy is working its way up the East Coast, just as an example there. So a military invasion during a grid down and all the other scenarios that we talked about in here would be devastating. And at that point, it will be simply left up to the survivors, the remainder of the military to stand together and do what we can to secure this nation. We looked at the waves, the pre-wave, the first, second, third, and fourth wave. The pre-wave was basically an initial attack, but somewhat disguised as ransomware. So that nothing seems, I hate to say it, but out of place because we see so many ransomware attacks. And that will disrupt our supply chains. That's when the actual first wave begins. And we saw with it that it's gonna take down our pharmacies, our hospitals, it's gonna limit people's access to the medicine they need in some cases to stay alive. And this is gonna start a panic. Then when the traffic is taken down, the traffic control systems, this is gonna put people at a standstill. The smart homes are now gonna be useless. The stock market will crash and bank accounts will empty. Social services will stop. Police and fire won't be able to respond even if they still want to. And all of the first wave will occur within the first hour. The second wave we saw a disruption of all of our gas supplies, our water supply, our sewage control, satellite communication possibly crashing the satellites down, the government hackers getting more and more into the government systems, and the emergency broadcast system being hacked into even if it's not everywhere, and then a total loss of communications phones, internet, TV, everything. And at that point, people's panic, people's fear, people's anxiety will be at an all-time high. A lot of people will start to sense what's going on. A lot of people will not. Those that do sense what's going on are going to be heading out of the cities and getting to their bug out locations or beginning their bunker down process. Those who don't know what's going on are going to be at a loss. If they can't realize very quickly that this is an attack, then they're going to be the victims of the third wave and after. The third wave we saw was a complete grid down along with the destruction of our power plants, followed by the fourth wave, which is military invasion. Now this is what I consider the worst case scenario without using nuclear weapons because if this type of attack is done efficiently to where the first shots that are fired are basically on the fourth wave when the military does invade, then they've essentially almost taken the country with the first three waves without ever firing a shot. And by the time the first three waves are over, a large portion of the population will simply be in panic, denial, and fear and they won't be able to fight back, but a lot of us will. Now this video I know seemed like a lot of gloom and doom, but I just wanted to look at the worst case scenario. I always feel like if you prepare for the worst, if you look at this video and talk about the things we talk about, and if you've got preps in place for each of these situations, then you're gonna do very well, especially if you have a plan. The plan is the most important part. A plan can outweigh your preps. So have a plan to deal with every one of these situations. I realize the fourth wave, the military invasion is gonna definitely be the hardest one to deal with. But everything else we can take into account and we can plan for. And a lot of that we covered in the final grid down video, which is gonna be coming out here in a few days. Thanks a lot for watching. God bless. And for now, Sears Survivor, out.